Thank you for uh, staying back. And uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, this slot uh, and also for accommodating my request to change my talk from the previous slot. So I'll uh, sit down. Uh, so I understand that the topic of uh, my uh, presentation is different from probably most of the talks that have been here. So I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, Boolean functions and something called sensitivity and complexity. So I'll be telling you about sensitivity, I'll be telling you about complexity, but there is something to be said about sensitivity and complexity. That is, sensitivity influences the complexity of function. But um, so I'll consider myself successful if I just tell you the definition and the result, and uh, the proofs may be overlap. So what are Boolean functions? Boolean functions take inputs. So here n is the number of input bits. Yeah. So these are functions where the inputs are just zeros and ones. Yeah. And the output is also zero or one. And so zero is false, one is true, if you're more used to that. So here are some examples of Boolean functions. This is an OR function. An OR function means there should be at least one one in the input for the output to be declared one. If all the inputs are zero, then the function is zero. If even one of them is one, it is one. And the AND is some sort of a dual. It requires all the inputs to be one for it to fire. Okay. Majority, if there are at least n over two of these bits that are one, then the function fires and the value is one. Otherwise, the value is zero. Yeah. If only a minority of the x size is one, then the value of the function is uh, zero. Parity function. So there should be an odd number of ones that are one. Okay, I'm just giving you a list of functions, hopefully. And then there are very strange sort of functions where you view the n bits as actually the bits of a number. Yeah. So you think of these numbers, these bits arranged like this, and you read this as a binary number. And then this function is one if this binary number happens to be a prime. For example, if x0 is 0, then the value of the function is 0, because then it's an even number. And this is an OR of ANDs. So here is a little circuit which depicts this function. Uh, so there are the first N variables in the first row. You compute their AND. Then you compute the AND of the second row and the last row. And if even one of the rows is completely one, the function is one. So these N squared variables here, you can think of them as arranged in a matrix. And if even one of the rows is completely one, the output is one. So this is just a made up function that I. So these are various Boolean functions. And I would like to explain now what I mean by sensitivity. So, so you have a Boolean function here. And you have an input x, a particular assignment of input. On that input, the function might take the value 0 or take the value 1. And now you ask, if I change one of the bits from 0 to 1, does the value of the function change? And the sensitivity of the Boolean function f at the point x is the number of locations. So that if you perturb x in that location, the value of the function changes. Okay. So, and the sensitivity of the function itself, look at the input, the worst place where the sensitivity is maximum, that sensitivity is called the sensitivity of the function. Is that clear? Yeah. So, I, yeah, so you're free to uh, ask me questions at any point yeah, if something is not clear. In return, I'll ask you questions also. So, uh, 
So yeah, so would you like to tell me what is the sensitivity of the OR function? Is there an input where changing a large number of bits individually would change the value of the function? Is there any input where changing any bit would cause the function value to change? The OR Yeah, I, I call up them are zero, then it will change. Excellent, excellent. So the uh, sensitivity of OR is N, at any other input, yeah, so suppose there were two ones already in the input, then what is the sensitivity on such an input? Zero, because changing any one bit is not going to change the value of the function. Just we'll go over these examples so that you understand what sensitivity is. Okay. Um, majority. Yeah. So this function. If the input is all zeros, if you change one of the bits, let's say that you have a large number of it, n is 20. If you change one of the bits from zero to one, when already the, all the bits are zero, is it going to change the majority? No, I mean, that's why many of us don't work. Yeah, uh, but when there's exactly half of the inputs that are one and half of them are zeros, then changing maybe any of those zeros to one will change the majority. So the sensitivity there is N over two. Yeah, because half the bits are sensitive. Similarly, when a little more than half are one, changing any of the ones back to zero would cause the function from becoming, from going from majority to non-majority. So here the sensitivity is about n over two. Parity function, if there are an odd number of ones currently, changing any bit is going to make it even. So here the sensitivity is n and here the sensitivity is n everywhere. In the case of R, you had to think of a particular input where the sensitivity was high. In this sensitivity is high everywhere. R of ands, yeah, if this was a matrix you remember of n once, uh, n, yeah. And if you have exactly one row which is all ones, then changing any of those n bits would cause the value of the function to change. Okay, so here the sensitivity would be n, but the total number of bits is n, n squared, and here the sensitivity is n. So I hope the notion of sensitivity is clear, and it is something like how many directional derivatives are non-zero. Yeah, and uh, I mean I tried to write that, hoping that this somehow appeals to you more than what I have been saying. Yeah, so if you can imagine a Boolean function as a labeling of the Boolean cube. These are all possible inputs, what I have written in blue. And I have labeled these points green or orange, depending on whether the function takes the value one or zero. Now, the point is that we define sensitivity. Another way of viewing sensitivity is you look at a point and ask how many of the neighbors have a different value. That is what sensitivity is. Good. So I hope uh, the notion of sensitivity of a function is clear. Decision trees. So this so sensitivity is an abstract notion, a property of the function. Yeah. So if you have a function like real function, you can say what is the highest derivative? How noisy is? How kind of wildly varying is the function? That is our usual notion of sensitivity. But here, this is some discrete version. That's what we have discussed so far. Now, we are going to think of computing functions using decision trees. So suppose I want to compute a function. Well, I look at the first variable, x1. If it is 1, then I know that the OR is 1. I don't need to look at the other variables. I found 1, 1. Okay. On the other hand, if it, if, I, if it is 0, I look at the next variable and then decide. So depending on the function, there might be a different tree which helps you find the value of the function. And different functions might require different amounts of effort to compute. Yeah. For example, the parity function, parity on two variables, I can first look at x1 equal the value of x1. And if it is 0, then I examine x2. And if since I already knew that x1 was 0, if x2 is 1, then I say 1. Otherwise, I say 0. So what is interesting for us, or the notion of complexity of the function is how deep does the decision tree for computing it have to be? If you require many questions to answer the 
value uh, to determine the value of the function, then we are going to call it a complex function. If you can build somehow a very efficient tree, which is very shallow, then we will say that the function is uh, not very complex. And now you also have, these are all deterministic decision trees. You also have randomized decision trees where in addition to asking questions, you can toss coins. Yeah, I put a dollar gate there. So you, whenever you, sorry, a dollar node there. So whenever the computation reaches a dollar node, it tosses a coin. And if it is head, you go one way, the other way, let's assume our coins are all fair. It probably, yeah. So in randomized decision trees, we ask, you know, we allow ourselves some small amount of error and we want to uh, compute the function uh, just like we did here, but we allow some error. That is, if the function is zero, you can say one with very some small probability and similarly. So these we have talked about, the best depth of a deterministic decision tree, the best depth of a randomized decision tree, one would expect randomization helps. Okay. But there was a very interesting, important result in the 1990s due to Nissan, which showed that actually randomization doesn't help too much. Okay. That is, randomized depth may be smaller than deterministic depth, but random, deterministic depth is at most cube of the randomized depth. That means it doesn't help exponentially or something. In other models of computation, randomization sometimes helps exponentially. But as far as decision trees are concerned, even if you allow a little bit of error, it doesn't make a very big difference to the complexity of the function. And uh, in the proof of these statements, sensitivity played a role. It turns out that what controls the complexity of a function is essentially its sensitivity. If the function has a point where it is very sensitive, then you will need a lot of effort to compute the function. And if you know that it is not sensitive, then there is always a cheap decision tree which computes the function. And finally, what do we do? Uh, we look at size instead of depth. And somehow for 30 years, Nobody bothered about the size of a decision tree. What's the size of the decision tree? The number of nodes in the decision tree. And what we show is that even for size, randomization doesn't help. If you have a decision tree of a certain size, well, of course, randomization can, cannot get worse, but somehow you can put a fourth power of the log of the randomized decision tree, and that will be an upper bound on the decision tree on the size of the deterministic decision tree. This quantity is the size of the deterministic decision tree. This quantity is the size of the randomized decision tree. And if your randomized decision tree is small, then there is an alternative dis deterministic decision tree, which is also small. That is the message of this. In the proof of this, we needed to use something called block sensitivity instead of sensitivity. Sensitivity amounted to moving in certain orthogonal directions block sensitivity move, amounts to a directional derivative in arbitrary directions. And that somehow helped us prove this. And uh, that is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Questions? In exit polls or something, uh, can we uh, work out what is sensitivity and how bad is it if we do a randomized test? Yeah, so this has been studied from the 50s, I forget. There, there's a notion of influence. And one tries to ask which polling method should we use not, so that no single group exerts a very great influence on the outcome. So these notions of sensitivity, influence, they have connections to voting theory. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't have anything specific to say which follows from our result. Questions? So 
if I understood right, you were saying that, you know, like if you could find a randomized uh, thing of randomized uh, decision tree of some size, yes, you there is a statement that there exists a, a particular bound on what kind of uh, non-randomized thing you can get. Yes. But is there a way to kind of go towards it? How, how you know, like, yeah, given so a randomized decision tree of some yeah, size? Yeah, so somebody decision. gave me a ran yeah, randomized algorithm. Is there a procedure which will transform that randomized algorithm to deterministic algorithm? At the moment, no. Both these somehow are related to something called sensitivity. But sensitivity is the sensitivity of the function at the worst place. And there are two to the end places where the sensitivity is defined. So none of these is effective in that sense. Okay. Uh, related question. Is there a given a function which is sensitive? Yes. Is there a way to kind of uh, make it into functions which are less sensitive somehow? Uh, uh, composing. Smooth it out somehow. Yeah, somehow. yeah. I mean, you suppose you had a function which was varying very, you could say, can I add some noise or something to smooth yeah. it out? Can I smear it out? Or smear something? it out. I understand what you're saying. And, yeah. Uh, and so, um, yeah. So, I'm not able to say directly, but there are notions of influence. No, what I have said is very discrete sensitivity. There's something called noise sensitivity. And there, basically, what you do is you take the function and the high Fourier coefficients, you suppress them and you get a function which has lower Fourier coefficients. And if the Fourier coefficients are concentrated on small sets, now we are doing Fourier analysis over F2 to the N or something like that, then you can show that the function can at least be approximated clearly, easily. Yeah. So this notion of sensitivity, et cetera, also controls the degree of the polynomial which will interpolate a mm -hmm. function, and uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Okay. So, the, are there like effective approximations of Boolean functions? Is that yeah, there are effective by just suppressing the high Fourier coefficients. Okay. I was expecting a question. What about quantum decision trees? And I don't know, all these people have <laughs> stopped, forgotten their physics. So, uh, So, yeah, so it turns out that uh, there is only a square root improvement. That is, if you have a quantum helps, but not more than square root. That is, if some function has high com deterministic complexity, the quantum complexity will at least be square, yeah, square root of that. You don't get exponential improvement in this model from quantum. On that disappointing note, we can go for lunch. Uh, yeah, before question. that, uh, can decision trees operate on the output, uh, on the input? For example, you showed the decision tree for odd function. Yes. And if every one of them is zero, it has to go from one to the other. But I can just take the sum of all the inputs. If it's one, I know it's a, it's a one. And if it's zero, I know every one of them is zero. So can decision tree yeah. operate on so the... You're saying, do you have operations which look at all the bits at once and compute a value. Yeah. yeah. So that is not this model. That is a model of algebraic circuits. Okay. So there is a whole industry of showing lower bounds for circuits where you don't have, you are not examining bits at each point, but computing certain functions. Okay. Or you could say, can I build a computation where at each step, I'm taking a majority of a certain subset of bits and based on that, I'm branching. So those things are studied, yeah, and there are results and lower bounds for those. They also capture the sensitivities. Uh, in a yeah, way. so they are not completely controlled by sensitivity. Okay. Yeah, because a single majority in one step can compute an answer, which is as a function is quite sensitive. So in one query, you can do some very complicated thing, but for decision trees, somehow sensitivity uh, captures the notion of complexity. If you're willing to live up to this polynomials. I see. Thank you. Uh, let us thank the speaker. One last thing.